I thank the board and the trustees of CEDA for the invitation to, uh, to join you for your annual dinner. This is the fifth time, in fact, that uh, I've had this pleasure, and it continues a, a long tradition. Given that it is the fifth time, I'm going to be um, updating some of the presentation material that I have uh, shown you uh, on past occasions uh, in, in the hope that uh, you might find that of interest. The first time I addressed this gathering uh, was in 2006, and we talked about the role of finance in uh, promoting economic development. An important part of that story was that through history, <coughs> financial development and innovation went hand in hand with the extraordinary growth in living standards uh, that was experienced as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Another part of that story was that financial development uh, didn't come without risk. And on some occasions in history, those risks uh, materialised in damaging or even devastating fashion. Now, back in 2006, we were talking about, among other things, the rise in debt uh, among Australian households and the various risks that might uh, accompany that. As it turns out, we'd had a so-called stress test on the banking system as part of the IMF's uh, annual visit to us. And the results of that uh, had in fact been uh, pretty good. We weren't quite sure or just how reassured we ought to be by such good results, of course. And we talked at that time in 2006 about an increase in risk taking in certain parts of the corporate sector that was starting to, uh, to grow very active in private equity and, and so on at that time. We wondered how all of that would turn out. Well, we didn't have long to wait to find the answers to uh, questions like that. The next time I came to CEDA, two years later, in 2008, the GFC, so-called, had erupted. And the global economy and the financial system globally were facing their darkest moments since the 1930s. In fact, we've just had the G20 here, as you've seen. Uh, the G20 leaders had, had that year, November 2008, just met for the first time in Washington and taken the first steps towards putting the global financial system back onto an even keel. Well, by that stage, growth in Australia had begun to moderate, but we feared that a much more significant slowing could be in prospect. Confidence was shaken and, understandably, households and businesses became much more cautious about spending, about taking on debt or investing in new processes or new ideas. The deteriorating global outlook also led to large declines in asset prices globally and the prices of commodities relevant to Australia. And the feeling at that time was that our terms of trade, which had risen quite a bit, in the preceding few years uh, had probably peaked. The fall in the terms of trade we expected to see uh, was thought likely to subtract quite markedly from growth in national income over the years ahead. Well, it's a matter of record that due to a combination of factors, uh, our economy and its financial system came through that real life stress test remarkably well, all things considered. And as it turned out, uh, our terms of trade had further, in fact, a lot further, to rise. If I can get this to run, which I can't, maybe uh, somebody can give us the first slide if that's possible. Thank you. Uh, so when I came uh, in uh, 2010, two years after the GFC had hit, it was time to introduce this chart, which I'm going to update uh, progressively this evening. It's been a, a feature of my presentations here subsequently, and it will be again. At that time, the terms of trade had just broken through the peak of the uh, preceding uh, uh, the two years earlier, and on a five-year average basis. In fact, we're at their highest level since Federation. Our assumption was they probably already peaked in 2010 and would decline steadily over the next few years. Well, hmm. 
Updating the chart two years later, that assumption proved to be uh, somewhat pessimistic. The terms of trade in fact peaked uh, a year later than we thought and about 12% uh, higher than we thought uh, in uh, September of 2011. By now, um, I'm sorry, that was the first one. Then that was the second one where they'd uh, risen and uh, we, we then moved to putting an 11 year <coughs> moving average on the chart, and the point of that was to emphasise how persistent this episode is. Um, we've never assumed this was going to be permanent, but if there's an event big enough and persistent enough that a 10-year average of your terms of trade is 50 or 60 per cent higher than the century trend, well, that's a big deal. Anyhow, by, by that stage, um, the, the terms of trade had peaked, and started to come down. And it was an assumption on our part that that would continue, that the terms of trade would keep falling. And so they have. Uh, this is where we are now. In the latest version, uh, they've fallen by about 13% since I was here two years ago and about 22% since their peak, though as you can see, they remain a long way higher, than, a long way above uh, the long-run historical average. As uh, additional supply of commodities comes onto the global market, a lot of that from our own country, and as demand is now growing and presumably will keep growing more slowly than it was uh, hitherto, our best guess would be that the terms of trade will probably fall some more over the period ahead. Even if they do fall quite a bit, that 10 or 11 year moving average uh, will still have been quite high for quite some time. So it's been a very big episode. And just as importantly, and as this history I've given you amply demonstrates, any of these forecasts have a wide range of uncertainty. This in fact is something that uh, the Reserve Bank has emphasised quite a lot in the past couple of years. Uh, we've put much more emphasis on uh, ranges in our forecasts and, and estimates of how much uncertainty there is around any economic forecast, uh, and that range of uncertainty is quite substantial. Well, the increase in the terms of trade prompted a surge in investment to supply uh, these commodities which now commanded higher prices. And uh, this surge in uh, capital spending by the resources sector has been a pretty big deal. Typically, resource investments around 2% of GDP or 3% in a big year. Uh, two years ago, we, we forecast that it was going to peak at about 8%. In fact, it's peaked just a little less than that, and it's now on the way down, and there's some... Uh, uh, some observations after the vertical line there that show, roughly speaking, what we think uh, will happen um, uh, from here on in. Uh, resource capex has fallen um, uh, to about 7% of GDP now. And as this shows, uh, and this is based on quite a lot of lead, uh, detailed liaison work that we do with the mining companies, which has proven to be invaluable and reasonably accurate over time, uh, there's substantial falls ahead. Even with those falls, there are still some quite large projects in the gas sector that will hold overall uh, resource sector investment at levels which, even at the end of the chart, are still quite high by the standards of, of any history up until the past few years. Well, as the uh, expansionary effects of, of that surge uh, tails off and indeed is reversed, even if partly, of course, other sources of demand in the economy need to play a stronger role in driving growth. Now, it's very clear that one of those sources of, uh, of growth is growth in resource exports, which is using the capacity that this investment has, in fact, put in place. Uh, if you take iron ore, roughly speaking, we are nearly finished now in the process of uh, increasing capacity from a million tonnes a day to two million. And that's being extracted and shipped and so resource export volumes are growing very quickly and indeed the contribution of net exports, so-called, to GDP growth in the past couple of years has been very strong, the strongest for uh, about a decade or so. Even so, even with that, 
we still need uh, stronger growth than we have had in the part of the economy that's outside the resources sector. Now, we're getting some of this. Um, this is a chart that shows GDP growth and an estimate of so-called non-mining activity where we attempt to strip out the resource uh, sector and look at uh, what's left. Now, uh, this comes with, with a caution and a caveat that this is, this is hard to do. It's an estimate. Uh, one can't claim that, that these are terribly uh, precise. It's as good as you can do, uh, but it does come with that caveat. That said, uh, the orange line is starting to pick up uh, and it's grown over the past year or so uh, at its fastest pace uh, since uh, about 2008. So that's good, but it would be good to see uh, more strength here in the future as that decline in mining sector capital spending continues. There are sufficient spare labour resources that we could probably enjoy a couple of years of non-mining output growth being above its trend pace before we needed to worry too much about serious inflation pressure. Now, the non-resource sector in the traded part of the economy, the external facing part of the economy, could contribute to that and I think should contribute to it. The decline in the exchange rate uh, that we've had uh, will be helpful uh, in contributing to that. But the currency does remain above most estimates of its long-run fundamental value, particularly given the further decline in commodity prices that we've seen uh, over uh, this year. An exchange rate that was more in line with fundamentals would be a helpful contributor to achieving the sorts of balanced growth outcomes that we need. Turning then to domestic sources of demand and away from the resource sector and the, the export sector, an obvious contributor, and we're all aware of this, is uh, uh, the set of forces at work in the housing sector. Investment in new dwellings is rising quite strongly. Now, I think it ought to be possible, if we're sensible with demand management and sensible on the supply side, for this to go further yet, and more importantly, for this higher level of activity to stay high for longer than we've typically seen in the past. A high level of construction in housing, maintained for a longer period of time, I think is vastly preferable to a sharp boom and then bust. That alternative outcome, the boom and bust, would probably give us a higher peak in the near term, but uh, most likely then a slump in this form of activity while mining uh, investment was still falling. So I don't think that would be helpful. A sustained period of strong construction, on the other hand, would be more helpful from the point of view of encouraging growth in non-mining activity and surely also from the wider perspective of uh, housing our growing population in an affordable way. Considerations such as these are among the reasons that we ought to take a close interest in developments in dwelling prices, the flow of credit for that purpose, uh, for housing purchase, and the prudence with which such funds are advanced. Given that this has been topical lately, it's probably opportune for me to offer tonight a few uh, observations uh, on this topic before I proceed with uh, the rest of the presentation. Having fallen in uh, late 2010 and early uh, 2011, dwelling prices have since risen. Nationally, the median price across the country is up by about $100,000 in that time, or about 18% since the low point. Prices have risen in all capital cities, though with a fair degree of variation. The smallest increase has been in Canberra at about 6%, the largest in Sydney at 28%. Credit outstanding to households, something that we look at very carefully, is rising at about 6 to 7% a year. Now, I personally don't think that that per se is, is a matter of concern. When we turn to the rate of growth of credit to investors, and I don't mean here property developers, I mean individuals who are borrowing for the purpose of investing in a housing asset, we see that that's picked up to about 10% a year over the past six months. 
and investors now account for nearly half of the flow of new housing credit. It's not clear whether this acceleration will continue or abate. It isn't clear whether the pace of price increases for dwellings will continue or abate. And it's not to be assumed that investor activity per se is uh, problematic. Indeed, a fair proportion of investor transactions are involved in putting new housing stock onto the market. And that's good, we need that. It can also be observed, I think, that uh, a bit more of the animal spirits that are evident in the housing market uh, would be welcome in some other sectors of the economy. Nor, let me be clear, have we seen these dynamics so far, at least, as a threat uh, imminently to financial stability, and indeed that should be clear from our recent uh, publication on that. So we don't just assume this is a terrible problem. But by the same token, given everything we've seen around the world in the past seven or eight years in housing, it's surely imprudent not at least to question the comfortable assumption that this is all entirely benign. A situation where prices have already risen considerably in our two largest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, where something like a third of our people live, where prices are rising uh, at present considerably faster than incomes, and where an important area of credit growth has picked up the double digit rates, ought to prompt the reasonable observer to ask the question whether just a few people might maybe be starting to get just a little overexcited. Such an observer might want to satisfy themselves that lending standards are being maintained. And they might contemplate whether perhaps some suitably calibrated and focused action to help ensure sound standards, and that might perhaps lean into the price dynamic to some extent, might be appropriate. So that's the background to the very much publicised single sentence in our recent financial stability review to the effect that the bank was working with other agencies to see what more might be done to reinforce sound lending standards. Let me be clear what this is not about, okay? It's not an attempt to restrain uh, construction activity. On the contrary, this is an attempt to be as sure as we can be that we elongate the upswing in housing construction. Nor is it a return to widespread attempts to restrict lending via direct controls. I'm old enough to remember that era very well, and that was one in which the price of credit overall was simply too low. Credit growth to just about everybody was too fast and we were trying and failing to restrain that credit growth by the resort to uh, regulatory tools instead of raising its price. That didn't make sense. Uh, but that isn't the problem we have today. Uh, we don't have the problem that interest rates are too low across the board. And the fact that credit growth generally is fairly moderate uh, is, uh, testifies to that fact. The level of interest rates is very low, but that's well warranted on macroeconomic grounds. The economy has spare capacity. Inflation's well under control, and that looks quite likely to be the case uh, over the next couple of years. In such circumstances, monetary policy ought to be accommodative, and it is, and on present indications is likely to be that way for some time yet. But for accommodative monetary policy to do the best mm -hmm. thing for the whole economy, it's helpful if uh, pockets of potential over-exuberance don't get too carried away in the process. Let me turn then from housing investment to investment more generally, that is by businesses, and here a more robust picture for capital spending outside of mining would certainly be part of a further strengthening of growth over time. Some of the key, in fact a number of the key ingredients for that are in place. To date there are some promising signs here of stronger intentions but not so much yet in the way of actual commitments by businesses. That's often the way it is at this point of the cycle. Firms wait for the time when they feel more confident. They wait to see whether there's more evidence of stronger demand. And of course, part of the stronger demand when it comes is gonna come from them, 
It's somewhat circular, but that is actually how the economy works. So that's a, 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 an area where we need to watch this space. With respect to uh, consumer demand, I need to complete the picture by showing an update of another chart from last time. This is house <coughs> household saving rate and the ratio of debt to income on the right hand side. Not a lot has changed here if we update this. That's what's happened, so uh, not a huge amount. Uh, debt is, is rising just a little faster than income right now because income growth is uh, quite slow because of the falling terms of trade. The saving rates come down a little bit. That's not that surprising. Uh, household consumption growth has picked up a little bit. I'd, I'd, I'd describe it as moderate. And given that interest rates are low, that asset values and wealth have risen, uh, a slight decline in the rate of saving is not that surprising and indeed we think it may decline a little further in the period ahead. The thing I think we shouldn't expect, and I've said this uh, many times before, is we shouldn't expect a period where household consumption persistently grows considerably faster than income year after year and the saving rate behaves the way it did from the mid 80s there through to about 2005. I very much doubt that that will happen again. I don't think it should happen again. And, um, uh, and the reason for that is that the debt load there is already quite high and it's probably not prudent for that to go up a long way from where we are. So that's what I have to say about sources of demand and, and none of that is, is terribly new. The other thing I'd like to come back to then is uh, some remarks I made last time about productivity. At that stage there was some evidence, very, very uh, tentative evidence that uh, productivity was starting to improve. So here is the, the level of labour productivity. We take out mining and utilities because the very unusual things have happened in those two sectors. So this is the, the rest of the market part of the economy. The level through time and some trend rate of, rates of growth. And you can see that 93.4 to 03.04 was a stellar period. That was a remarkably good period for productivity growth in Australia. And then things slowed down quite materially after that. Two years ago, uh, I, I pointed to that uh, uptick in the red line and said, well, that's a promising sign, but, but let's uh, see what happens. That's what's happened if we extend the trend and extend the actual data. So it's becoming clearer, I think, that labour productivity as measured this way uh, is on an improving track now. The standard caveats apply. It's hard to measure productivity. This is not multi-factor productivity, which is even harder to measure. It's, it's the simpler concept of labour productivity. But to me, at least there's some evidence that's consistent with the hypothesis that things are getting onto a better track. We shouldn't find that surprising. Business models right around the, the country have been challenged by the substantial change occurring in the economy. That change itself is a response to changes in relative prices, in technology, in the exchange rate, and so on. The good news is that businesses can respond to that, and they have been doing so. That, that's the good side of that story. That process will need to continue. There'll be no let up. And you will recall that there is the so-called to-do list that we've talked about on other occasions as set out by uh, the Productivity Commission. So this is good news, and those remaining challenges uh, uh, remain uh, for us uh, and, and will uh, in the period ahead. What I'd like to do, though, is to now in the remaining time is to pose a slightly related but different set of questions. I think these questions are increasingly being asked and it's about whether our overall business environment is conducive enough to risk taking and innovation and whether we're doing enough to develop the relevant competencies and capabilities for the modern world. These questions might involve or might include ones like, how easy is it to start a business? If the business fails, as many do, uh, particularly small ones, is it easy enough to try again? 
How easy is it to hire employees? And I know I'll get in trouble for saying this, but how easy is it also to let the employees go if things don't work out? Because if it's too hard to let them go, then it's too hard to hire them to begin with. Are the rewards of a scientific and research career sufficient to attract a share of our, of our best and brightest? Or are they all going into designing financial products? What's the role of private sector support for research and development, as distinct from our rather heavy reliance historically on government support? Is business itself doing enough here? Does industry want to get more involved in R&D? Does academia want to let it? Can private finance, be that banks or venture capital, angel investors, private equity, whoever, can they get more involved in supporting innovation? Are the entrepreneurs who'd like to receive that support prepared to accept the discipline that comes with it? These and other questions, this is a much broader discussion than the competitiveness conversations we typically have, as important as they are. We're really coming at the question of whether we can have the competencies across multiple dimensions to be effective in the modern global economy. I don't know the answer to that because these questions, frankly, are beyond my competence uh, to answer. I would note that others more qualified than I have given opinions on these things. And indeed, <coughs> CETA itself has done some interesting work uh, that's relevant to, to a number of, of these questions. So I'd refer you uh, to those, those uh, documents. So this is very hard. The, 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 the thing I'd like to do, though, is to give a positive commentary about Australian competence in one thing that I've myself observed fairly closely over the past year. Um, you might have noticed we've just hosted the G20. Uh, this is quite a big deal. Here was something global, complex, requiring careful leadership. Uh, we last hosted G20 in 2006 in Melbourne, and I was at that meeting. Uh, in fact, I'm one of the few governors um, still around who was at that uh, ministers and governors meeting at the time. Since then, the scale and complexity of the G20 have grown uh, almost uh, beyond recognition. In those days, the leaders didn't meet. Now they meet every year. There are a host of ministerial and other meetings at various levels, something like 60 formal meetings a year under the auspices of the G20. There's the B20, the C20, the L20, the Think20, the Youth20, various other groups. All of these have their own legitimate reason for being. They all have their own agenda. Somehow we have to make those agendas fit with the main G20 agenda. And that main G20 agenda itself seriously needed uh, refining, focusing and streamlining uh, this year. The G20 needed to show that it could effectively meet the challenge of securing better economic performance, or to use the language that the G20 has been using to, to, get, uh, to, to uh, foster strong, sustainable and balanced growth. Australia, meanwhile, is one of the smallest members of this group by GDP and certainly by, by population. We can't match the scale of human resources available to the larger countries on every single work stream that's in the G20. We're geographically remote. It's costly in money and time for people to come here. We're not powerful enough simply to demand that they follow our lead or to command their attention. And it was our job to manage this rather unwieldy body effectively in 2014. Well, I, I wasn't at the meetings in Brisbane, um, but I've been at a number of the other meetings uh, during the year. And the feedback that I've received from my counterparts is uniformly and universally positive, and strongly so. They judge that the Australian presidency has, by the metrics that count, been very successful. 
prodigious efforts by exceptionally dedicated people in the public and private sectors have ensured improvements to the agenda, to process, to logistics, to the conduct of meetings, uh, and to the outcomes of the G20. Substantive things have been achieved in the form of pro-growth commitments that, if they're carried through by the various jurisdictions around the world, will make a material difference to well-being of citizens in G20 countries. Achieving all that was costly in human and financial resources. It required coordination between multiple organisations. It wasn't on the scale of running the Olympics, something that Australia also did well, but it nonetheless has been a big deal and it's been done well. It wasn't achieved by effortless superiority. Rather, it owed to careful preparation, astute use of some of our natural advantages, and continuous effort over a long period. But that's where success always comes from, right? The only question is how badly we want it. Responsibility for the G20 now passes to Turkey. We can bask in the glow of success for a couple of weeks and then get on to other matters. But the point simply is, this has gone well. This is the thing that Australians have done well on a global stage. And it's the result of the determined efforts of a range of people who were clear about what they wanted to achieve and who mobilised the necessary resources and effort to get there. I might note in passing one other result of our leadership of the G20, and this is um, very much our treasurers uh, doing, is that the issue of infrastructure is well and truly on the table. Nobody doubts the need for infrastructure provision, not just in our country, but in many. And of course, it has clear economic advantages. It supports demand while you're building it, uh, but it also enhances the economy's supply capability for the future. So it has a short run and a long run payoff. It's also clear from the various discussions over this year that the problem isn't a shortage of capital to fund infrastructure investment. The issues to be overcome don't include finding the money. What they do include is appropriate project selection, long-term planning, governance around that whole process, appropriate contract design, appropriate risk sharing between the public and private sectors, both of whom have some risks that they're better at bearing than the other pricing the use of the infrastructure once it's built, and so on. There's an opportunity here, including for Australia, to do something of value over the years ahead. Of course, we'll need to be serious. We'll need to put in the effort over that extended period in all these areas. And if we don't put it in, not much infrastructure will be delivered. But if we are serious, a lot could be achieved. And I would imagine that the Committee for Economic Development of Australia would be keen to be involved in that process. Well, I've reached uh, the limits of our time this evening, so let me conclude. Australia's economy is continuing to grow moderately. It's been responding in ways you would expect to the rather extraordinary set of circumstances that it's faced over the past decade. I would argue that we've uh, met them with some success, though of course uh, the game is not yet over. There's continuing adjustment ahead and doubtless no shortage of challenges. But beyond the challenges of the next couple of years, maximising our economic possibilities in the modern world requires sustained efforts at adaptation and innovation at doing things better and better every day, and perhaps most of all, a willingness occasionally to take the odd risk. I'd be confident that we have or we could develop where needed the relevant capabilities. The only question really is whether we're sufficiently determined to succeed in deploying them. Thank you very much for your attention.